Hello! Thanks for watching, and welcome to the next video in my series on basic statistics. Now as usual, a few things before we get started. Number one, if you're watching this video because you are struggling in a class right now, I want you to stay positive and keep your head up. If you're watching this, it means you've accomplished quite a bit already. You're very smart and talented, but you may have just hit a temporary rough patch. Now I know with the right amount of hard work, practice, and patience, you can work through it. I have faith in you. Many other people around you have faith in you. So, so should you. Number two, please feel free to follow me here on YouTube, on Twitter, on Google+, or on LinkedIn. That way, when I upload a new video, you know about it. And it's always nice to connect with my viewers online. I feel that life is much too short and the world is much too large for us to miss the chance to connect when we can. Number three, if you like the video, please give it a thumbs up. Share it with classmates or colleagues or put it on a playlist. That does encourage me to keep making them for you. On the flip side, if you think there's something I can do better, please leave a constructive comment below the video and I will take those ideas into account when I make new ones. And finally, just keep in mind that these videos are meant for individuals who are relatively new to stats. So I'm just going over basic concepts and I will be doing so in a slow, deliberate manner. Not only do I want you to know what is going on, but also why and how to apply it. So all that being said, let's go ahead and get started. So this video is the next in our series about analyzing variance. In our last video, we discussed how to conduct hypothesis tests for the variance as compared to some predetermined standard or hypothesized value. Now this video is about comparing the variances of two independent samples using a new method, the F ratio and the F distribution. For this type of problem, we will test whether or not two sample variances are equal given the limits of random sampling. For example, a business analyst or quality assurance manager may wish to see if two machines are operating at the same level of variance. A cost center manager may wish to see if two employees have different variances for their call lengths. A stock analyst may wish to compare two stock variances to see which is a better fit given the risk profile of the portfolio. So as you can see, variance plays an important role in fields such as quality assurance, operations management, and finance. Ever heard of Six Sigma? Well, you probably have. Well, what is Sigma? Well, remember, Sigma is the symbol for population standard deviation, which of course is the square root of the variance. So central to Six Sigma and similar techniques is the monitoring, reduction, and comparison of process variance. For example, Consumer Reports or CNET may want to compare the battery life variance of two smartphones, which is more predictable. So yes, longer battery life is more important, but so is consistent battery life. A sports statistician may wish to see which of two teams is more consistent in its scoring. Now I do want to be honest with you. This topic is not easy, but I will go slowly and use a concrete real world example to guide you along. But you may need to pause the video now and then to let what you are learning sink in a minute before moving on. So all that being said, let's go ahead and get to work. So as always, I like to begin with an example. And this is the example of the Terrific Tuna Company. So the Terrific Tuna Company uses two machines to fill each five ounce can of tuna. Now the quality assurance manager wishes to compare the variability or the variance of the two canning machines. So what we're testing here is, is the variance of machine one the same as the variance of machine two? Are they operating at the same variance level? So to do this, we collect a sample of cans from each machine for testing. The results are as follows. 
So for machine one, with a sample size of 25, a mean filling weight of 5.0592 ounces, a sample variance of 0 0.1130, and a sample standard deviation of 0 0.3361 ounces. Now for machine number two, with a sample size of 22, a mean filling weight of 4.9808 ounces, a sample variance of 0 0.0137, and a sample center deviation of 0 0.1171 ounces. So remember here, we're comparing the variances. So if you look at these, you can see that the variance for machine one is quite a bit higher than it is for machine two. But remember, these are samples. So there is going to be sampling error. So we need to know if this difference is statistically significant or just related to sampling error. So to conduct this analysis for equality of variances, we will need a new technique. Now remember that we are not comparing the sample variance to a hypothesized variance. We are comparing two sample variances with each other. Now the easiest way to compare the relative size of two measurements is by using a ratio. So in this case, the sample variance of machine one as compared to the sample variance of machine two. Now the way we arrange this in the F ratio is that the larger sample variance of the two goes in the numerator and then the smaller sample variance goes in the denominator. It doesn't matter what we call machine one or machine two. Where they go in the ratio depends on their size. So in the numerator in the top, it's the larger of the two, and in the bottom, it's the smaller of the two. So this is the F ratio. So we have the larger of the two sample variances on top and the smaller of the two sample variances on the bottom. So the F ratio follows its own distribution. So in independent random samples, N sub X and N sub Y, or you might see it written as N sub one and N sub two, are taken from two normal populations with equal variances, the sampling distribution of the ratio of those sample variances follows the F distribution. So again, here is our F ratio. So really the F distribution is a distribution of this ratio. So a few more things we need to talk about regarding the F distribution. The most important thing is that each of the numerator and denominator have their own degrees of freedom. So in the numerator, it's n minus one degrees of freedom. And in the denominator, it's n minus one degrees of freedom as well. So again, it just depends on which variance is in the numerator and which variance is in the denominator. So what we do is we find the larger of the two sample variances. So in this case, it is machine one. That will be the numerator in a ratio. Then we find the degrees of freedom based on sample size. So in this case, for the machine one, the sample size was 25. So we know that goes in the numerator. So our degrees of freedom, top and bottom, in this case are 25 minus one for the top, which is 24, of course. And then in the denominator, it's 22 minus one because our sample size was 22 for the other machine. So top and bottom, we have degrees of freedom of 24 and degrees of freedom of 21. So let's talk about reading the F table when you wanna find your critical values. Reading the F table can be a real pain. You have a choice of several significance levels like 0 0.01 or 0 0.05 or 1, 0 0.10, whatever else it might be, with a numerator degrees of freedom and a denominator degrees of freedom. In the stats book I use, I think the F table is five or six pages long. So to be honest, I either use an app for Android, which I'll talk about here in a second, or Excel. So the app I use in Android is called the Statistical Distribution App, and it's published by RealXY App. You can find it in the Google Play Store. Now this is very easy to use. You select your confidence level. So in this case, it's 0.95, remember. 
It's a one-tailed test. And then we put in our numerator and denominator degrees of freedom. So DF1 is 24, that's our numerator. DF2 is our denominator, that's 21 in this case. Hit compute and it comes back with a critical value of 2.0540. So that is the critical value on the F distribution, which marks the boundary between the lower 95% and the upper 5%. Now in Excel 2010, you can use the f.inv.rt function. So this has three inputs. You put the probability you're interested in that goes to the right, so 0 0.05. Then you have your numerator degrees of freedom, 24, that's degrees of freedom one. Then you have the denominator degrees of freedom, degrees of freedom two, which is 21. And it automatically finds that for you and you'll see that it equals 2.0540, the same thing the app gave us over here on the left. So really these are both digital F tables and give precise values for a given alpha level and degrees of freedom, both in the numerator and denominator. Reading the F table is really complicated and sometimes you can only get approximations. So I use either the app or or Excel to find my critical values. So remember we're using an F distribution with an alpha level of 0 0.05, a numerator degrees of freedom of 24, and a denominator degrees of freedom of 21. And again, those are based off our sample sizes. So this is that F distribution. So you can see on the left-hand side, we have our 95%, and in the right hand side, we have our 5%. So here's the Excel function, as you can see how I arrived at these numbers. So our F critical is 2.054. So this is the actual F distribution we will be using in this problem. So hypothesis testing for the equality of variance. So these kind of hypothesis tests for equality of variance are pretty straightforward. They really only follow one pattern. So our null hypothesis says that the variance, in this case of machine one, is the same as the variance of machine two. And the alternative is that they are not equal. So when we're testing for equality, it's either equal to or it's not. Now, the weird thing about the F distribution is that this equality hypothesis is an upper or right tailed distribution. So you might think that based on the equality and non-equality signs that this should be a two-tailed distribution. That's what it was up to this point. But remember that we always place the larger sample variance in the numerator. Therefore, the F ratio in this type of problem is always an upper-tailed test in the upper-tailed distribution. It's just one of those quirks when you're using the F ratio and the F distribution. Testing for equality of variance is an upper or right tailed test. So here's everything we had before. Let's go ahead and calculate our F statistic. So we have the sample variance on top, machine one and the sample variance of machine two on the bottom. And again, that's only because machine one had the larger variance. That's why it goes on top. So that was 0 0.1130, and the variance for machine two was 0 0.0137. So we go ahead and divide those out, and we come up with an F statistic, or our test statistic, of 8.248. Now where does that fall on our distribution? Well, it falls off of our distribution. It's so large that it goes way, way out to the right. So what do we conclude? We will reject our null hypothesis because it's in the rejection region. It's way, way into the rejection region. So based on these two samples, these variances are not equal. So it goes well beyond what we might expect due to sampling error alone. It's very, very high. So an F ratio variance recap. So remember the F ratio is based on two sample variances. The larger variance is placed in the numerator and the smaller of the two in the denominator. 
and the critical F value is found using the F table or digitally. In my case, using an Android app or Excel with a chosen alpha level, a numerator degrees of freedom of n minus one, and a denominator degrees of freedom, n minus one. Now I did mention this earlier because I didn't want to freak you out, but the F distribution is really two chi-square distributions in a ratio. That's why each one has its own degrees of freedom, both the numerator and the denominator. Now the test statistic is the ratio of these two sample variances. If the test statistic is larger than the critical F value, we then reject the null hypothesis. So that wraps up our look into comparing two sample variances. Now remember, because we're using samples, there's gonna be some sampling error. So if one sample variance is higher than another, that doesn't mean automatically that the difference is statistically significant. There's gonna be a range of values that fall within our non-rejection region. The difference has to be large enough in the context of the F distribution in order to fall into that rejection region. Now also keep in mind, we are saying nothing about the means of these two processes. We're just looking at the variance. So in the previous video, I talked about looking at the mean and the variance kind of together, which we will do in ANOVA. But in this case, we're just looking at the variances, comparing those two variances. So a few reminders and then we are done. If you're watching this video because you are struggling in a class, Stay positive and keep your head up. You are a smart, talented, amazing person and never let anyone else tell you differently, including you. If you like the video, please give it a thumbs up. Feel free to follow me here on YouTube, on Twitter, on Google Plus, or on LinkedIn. It's always nice hearing from you. And finally, just keep in mind that the fact that you're on here trying to learn, trying to improve yourself as a student or as a business person, that is what really matters. I firmly believe if you have the right learning process in place, the results will take care of themselves. So thank you very much for watching. I wish you the best of luck in your studies and in your work, and I look forward to seeing you again next time.